What do you think the benefits of risk are to people? Well, I'll tell you the primary benefit of, uh, of risk is that oh, yeah. uh, it results in bloody good fun. I don't know if we're allowed to use cussing words on oh, your... Uh, heck yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a mild one, but uh, I'll cut loose later on in the interview. But yeah, I, I am disturbed about this this trend in society to, to try and remove you know, all, all risk, particularly physical risk, but, but lots of other things as well. G'day and welcome back to Real Risk, the adventure podcast. Now, for those who enjoy video podcasts, I've engaged with Podbooth here in Adelaide to produce the show, and I'm really excited about how it's going to work. For those who listen in the car or on your daily walk, the audio files, of course, will still be available. My name's Richard Harris, and you might remember me from my involvement in the 2018 Thai Cave Rescue. Well, that adventure has led to many other exciting opportunities, including the chance to chat with like-minded adventurers and risk-takers on this podcast. There's lots of exciting things to announce over the course of the season and plenty of brilliant, daring, adventurous and thoughtful guests already lined up. There'll be more extreme athletes, more divers, more soldiers, more people who get off on going fast, climbing high or challenging themselves in ways most of us can't even dream of. And all of them will talk to us about why they think the benefits outweigh the dangers, why risk is integral to making us stronger, more resilient and better able to cope with the stresses of daily life. And let's face it, when has that ever been more important? G'day, and welcome back to Real Risk, the adventure podcast. Lots of exciting guests are coming on board for the season, but don't forget, I'm really keen to hear your suggestions. Send me a message at realriskpodcast.com and let me know who you'd like me to chat with. Now, one of the requests I've had from numerous followers of the show is that I tell the story of the Thai Cave Rescue. Now, I figured nobody really wants to hear me bang on for an hour talking about myself, so I've very cunningly brought in my good mate Craig Challen into the show to help tell the story. Craig is a veterinary surgeon from Perth in Western Australia. Craig and I struck up a friendship in the mid-2000s and found ourselves both drawn to the somewhat niche activity of deep cave exploration. And when the soccer team became trapped in the cave in Thailand in June 2018, I was very happy to find Craig by my side as we embarked on what was an unprecedented and highly risky rescue attempt. Let's chat with Craig Challen. G'day, Craig. Good to see you. Great to be with you, Harry. Craig, um, I've had a lot of emails asking me to tell the story about the Thai Cave Rescue, and that is actually the last thing I felt like talking about. So what I thought I would do, uh, very cunningly in my view, is to get someone else on to the podcast to talk about the Thai Cave Rescue. And uh, as my my Batman to my Robin or my uh, whatever you were on that, I'm saying you were the Batman, by the way, I was the Robin. Whatever we were on that escapade, I thought you'd be a great bloke to have a chat about. Well, it's hard to believe that there's anybody in the world that hasn't heard the story yet because I seem to have told it to just about everyone and you've taken care of the leftovers. But uh, nevertheless, let's let's go with it. But I know there's a lot more to you, Craig, than the Thai Cave Rescue. I mean, you're a very three-dimensional character, very deep uh, and interesting man. So I want to go back a little bit and um, talk a bit about your life of adventure leading up to that point because I think that'll be a lot more interesting anyway. So... Tell us about young Craig. Where did where did he grow up and how did he get involved in various adventurous activities? Uh, well, I grew up in uh, Western Australia when I was very young in Perth and then uh, after that in a little town called Gijiganup, which is not that far out of Perth. But I had some good adventures as a kid and uh, was always encouraged to be in the outdoors. It stood me very well. So... After that, when I became a young adult, I was always really quite interested in adventure sports and, and outside activities and not so much your classical footy and cricket, uh, like most people that are um, into adventure sports, I think. So I went through a few of those, tried lots of things, you know, all the, the normal stuff that people do, parachuting and rock climbing and such like, and, and uh, did scuba diving as as one of those activities as people do and I, I i mean i was a bit of a late starter with that so i was i was nearly 30 i think when i did my open water scuba course and got into it quite quite liked having my head underwater but couldn't really get off so much on looking at fish and coral it was all right nice enough but it was a little bit boring really and uh, so i was i was starting to drift away from diving 
after a couple of years or so. But then I just happened to meet a, a guy, Steve Sturgeon, who was a cave diver of some repute over here in Western Australia and an instructor. And I hit it off pretty well with Steve. And you know, I'd never really heard about cave diving before that, like most people probably up until the, the time of the Thai cave rescue. But as soon as I heard about it, I, I was really taken by the whole idea. I thought, that's the thing for me. You know, how cool is that? And so I did all the, the courses and the, the training, as you do, and as, as we recommend that everybody does if they fancy getting into the sport. And uh, that was, what, in 96, I think. So 25 years ago now. And i uh, been into it ever since. And it's probably been the, the really, you know, defining thing of my uh, of my life, certainly of my adventuring career anyway, despite all the other things that I've dabbled in. I like the way that you said, uh, you know, you had a go at parachuting and rock climbing and scuba diving like all normal people do. So I wonder if, you know, people who do pursue adventure have a bit of a, a different mindset to what you would consider normal people. Yeah, well, we often discuss this, and I, yeah, I guess you you define your own reality or your your own normality a little bit, don't you? And especially as you get older, and you you get used to mixing with people primarily that are like you, and so you know, in cave diving there are and caving there are a few weirdos, I suppose. So maybe you you redefine your normality according to being more like them. But I, I remember you and I were at, at a conference, a cave diving con or diving conference that's held every couple of years, Oztech, a few years ago. And there, there was a group of us there. And we just, I, I asked how many people in that group, there may be 10 people in the, in the group. I asked them, you know, how many of them had been into team sports, mm -hmm. so footy or whatever, when they were kids. And not one person put their hand up. And uh, then I asked how many had been into motorbikes instead. And every person except one uh, said yes to that. So uh, I guess there's a, there's a few aspects of the, the character that, that really are pretty common in, in people that, oh, I don't think it's just cave diving, but you know, what would loosely term adventure sports, self-reliance, definitely, even though most of the time we're doing these activities, somebody else will be around and we're doing it with someone, but uh, you still have to be able to rely on yourself and get by and improvise unassisted when you need to. And a bit of determination and uh, probably a bit of tolerance to suffering and, and inconvenience and discomfort as well helps, helps it along a bit. I wonder if I was that one person who didn't have a motorbike because my mum wouldn't let me and my, now my wife won't. I think that speaks poorly of my character that I didn't uh, you know, push through that and, and get myself a, you know, a death machine like you have ridden over the years. Well, maybe, but I, I've noticed that you have dabbled a little bit. I've seen one parked in your driveway from time to time. So oh, well, I don't know what's going on there if you're just you know, harbour, harbouring somebody else's refugee motorbike. <laughs> well, there's nothing not to like about motorbikes, obviously. Yeah, no, it is interesting, the, the characteristics of adventurers, explorers, whatever you want to call the people that, you know, you might say are involved in various adventure sports and activities that, we, uh, that we're interested in. And, and the issue of self-reliance is interesting to me because I think there's a, a strong analogy for high altitude climbing, you know, above that death zone where there's no possibility of assisting anyone else with a rescue. Everyone really has to be responsible for their own decision making and their and their own lives really and uh, you know if someone's in trouble it can be very difficult or dangerous to attempt to rescue a, a friend or, or climbing partner and I think the same applies to cave diving you know once you're underwater and and deep or, or far into an underwater cave it's you know it can be a high risk activity to try and rescue someone who's who's in real strife so there has to be that you know you're diving with people but you're really diving by yourself aren't you well, that's true. And uh, yeah, I can appreciate the analogy. As as you know, I had a, a brief and unspectacular mountain climbing career. The problem really with that was that I started way too late and all the people that are doing it seriously, they all started when they were teenagers and, you know, probably came from Austria or, or Northern Italy or somewhere like that. So they just spent their whole lives doing it. But it's, it's also interesting to note what it's 
not as well. And you look at at people that from outside that that looking in on cave diving, they all seem it's some sort of you know esoteric weird sort of activity that people do, you know, have got a death wish or something that, 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 but that's not the case at all. I mean, certainly my experience with people that are into cave diving and adventure sports is they, they love life as, as much as anyone else, maybe more so. And it's just the way that they reach their self-fulfillment. And it's not about having any sort of extraordinary courage or anything like that. I mean, these are just normal people like anything anyone else, but they I think the difference is that they view risk rationally and they try and reduce it to what actually are the risks and, and don't react to the yep. you know the emotional aspect of it all. And that, which is, of course, the first step in in dealing with uh, with risk is to analyse it and decide whether it's something that's actually going to kill you if you let it, or you you can work around these things and and achieve what what you set out to do. And uh, you know, oh, it, it, probably one of the things that appeals to me most is is dealing with risk, but you know, in a controlled fashion. So you, you take the, the variables and you you try and isolate them and remove them so that you're going to get a positive outcome. Oh, I completely agree. What what do you think the benefits of risk are to people? Well, I'll tell you the primary benefit of, yeah. uh, of risk is it's, uh, it results in bloody good fun. I don't know if we're allowed to use cussing words on oh. your... Uh, Heck yeah. 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 <laughs> that was a mild one, but uh, I'll cut loose later on in the interview. But yeah, I, I am disturbed about this this trend in society to, to try and remove you know, all, all risk, particularly physical risk, but, but lots of other things as well. And uh, it's, you know, facing up to this and, and dealing with the unknown, it's, it's really important for helping people get by in just their normal lives. I mean, it's a, it's a jungle out there, really, and, and things go wrong and everybody in their life is going to have bad stuff happen. And the only way to really cope with that when it does come along is to have dealt with it in the first place or, you know, have practiced dealing with it. And if you can expose yourself to risk, and, and normally this argument when it's presented in terms of kids, but it's not just kids, it's adults, and it's a completely lifelong thing. And, you know, a subject close to both our hearts is, is dealing with fear. You, you can't, you know, you can't control whether you feel fear or not. And uh, people that, that do the sort of activities that, that we get into, they're not extraordinary from that point of view, I and mean, people feel fear. But what you can control is how you respond to that fear. I mean, that is completely up to you and completely controllable. And the choice that you have is you can either avoid it or you can face up to it and uh, then turn it around and kick its ass. And I heard it was uh, Sam Harris, the American commentator, um, made some a comment that really... Uh, struck a, a chord with me, which is that fake fear is, oh, sorry, fake courage is just as good as real courage. So if, if you're fearful of something, you face up to it and pretend that that fear is not there and just, you know, control this inner turmoil and deal with the situation and you keep doing that, then eventually that fake fear becomes real fear. So just fake it until you make it and, uh, you know, you find you can deal with a lot of stuff that you never would have thought you could. Yeah, I think that's valid. This word um, resilience has been thrown around a lot, I think, over the last year or two especially. And I think what we're talking about is desensitization, which by by facing things that are scary, you do become desensitized to them. I mean, you, you start to normalize them, at least to the point of being able to to you know work through problems without fear becoming an you know a barrier to to clear thinking and and to you know making sensible decisions so that kind of desensitization from a young age presumably is one of the things that builds resilience in in all of us so it's, it's got to be recommended 
Uh, yes, well, in uh, in older, less sensitive times, we would have just said, dry your eyes, princess, and harden up. But, of course, you can't say that now, can you? Well, you just did, but... Um, yeah. Well, well, well I can. I can yeah, say whatever can say, I want. Well, you're the guest. Mm. Well, let's have a look at risk and some of the stuff that you've um, faced. You mentioned your climbing, which ended, if I recall correctly, spectacularly by you falling off the, the hill and breaking your back. So uh, that, presumably that was one of the things that pushed you away from that sport. Well, breaking my back's a bit uh, a bit strong. That didn't actually happen. But uh, I uh, accounted for a couple of discs in my back and rushed back to Australia and had a, a few rounds of surgery on that, which was a little bit inconvenient and, and stopped my activities for a while. But after that, I decided that I'd, I'd leave the high altitude stuff alone and go down instead. Did you have to get carried off the mountain? There was a little bit of a helicopter trip, yeah, yeah, oh, which no, is but... professionally a little bit embarrassing, I'm afraid. <laughs> so then you, your foray into technical diving, which as I, I chatted with an earlier guest, Dr. Simon Mitchell, who's uh, well known to you. We kind of defined technical diving in that podcast, so we won't do that again, but basically deep diving, wreck diving, cave diving, using uh, other forms of scuba equipment like rebreathers and mixed gases and so forth, and decompression diving. You, you took that up with a bit of a vengeance in the late 90s and it was a fairly early adopter of, of rebreather technology. But wreck diving was a big part of that for you initially or was it always about the caves? Uh, I think I started off with caves and then drifted off to wreck diving in the in the 2000s and then came back to the the straight and narrow path of of cave diving. I mean, they've both got their attractions and and I enjoy both. I just, just that I had those opportunities in the, well, the decade before last now to do that wreck diving. But as far as getting started in technical diving, I mean, I was really lucky that I just hit on it at the right time. In the, in the late 90s, there was this period that uh, we, you know, a little bit self-indulgently maybe called the, the technical diving revolution. And it was all happening. The sport was becoming popularised. There were so many advances with, uh, with the technology and decompression science. Gases were becoming available. Computers were becoming available and uh, yeah. enabling us to, to do the advanced decompressions. And the internet had just become available to disseminate all this information as well. And it really at that time seemed like not a week went by where there was uh, some sort of technological breakthrough or somebody was doing some radical new big dive. And it was so exciting and I got caught up in that. Looking back now, we've come a long way and it has continued to adva advance, but it's got a little bit more difficult for people trying to break into it now. All the the easier exploration has been done, talking specifically about cave diving or probably about wreck diving as well. What was back then a really big dive? I mean, I can remember when I broke into this stuff and I thought, well, maybe I'll do a 100 metre dive one day just to sort of tick that off and prove that it can be done. And nowadays, as you know, I mean, 100 metre dive is, is really nothing. We would do that any day before breakfast time and uh, not think too much about it at all. And uh, it's now deeper than 200 metres is probably uh, equivalent to that. And people are regularly doing those dives all the time. So uh, things have advanced. And, and so if you're starting out now, it's, it's a, a little bit hard. I mean, it's easier in the sense that there's a lot more training and the, the rebreathers are more available and stuff like that. You can just go shopping and get what you want. But the the spirit of the whole thing is is not the same. It's no longer got this pioneering sort of feel to it, and uh, so I, I really sympathise a little bit with people that have missed out on that. One of the things I spoke to Simon Mitchell about was the the dive that he and Trevor Trevor Jackson did on uh, the wreck of of the Kyogle, hoping it was the the hospital ship Centaur, but. Uh, that was 178 metres and they did that in 2002. And at that time, that was a world record deep wreck dive and, you know, a spectacularly bold dive really for, for its time. You know, since then you've done uh, two 200 metre deep wrecks that I'm aware of and, uh, you know, with, with relative comfort and, and safety from, from what you've described. 
So things really have changed in terms of the, the technology and the knowledge and uh, understanding of the decompression science in, in particular. But you've had a couple of problems along the way. And I, I want to ask you about your uh, foray into decompression sickness or the bends uh, that you enjoyed for a few years because it's a really interesting um, story and at the risk of being slightly me- mean-spirited, there's some quite amusing anecdotes involved in it as well. So what was the first time that you got badly bent? And I should say that, you know, for, for regular technical divers, having a touch of the bends is not uncommon and we almost consider it to be like a, a minor sports injury perhaps. And it, I don't know if that's the right attitude, but you know, it, it is an inevitable part of, of this kind of diving. Yeah, but well, you, that's you a fair into, enough comment, but I should also preface, uh, preface any further remarks by saying that anybody else shouldn't probably have the same attitude to decompression sickness that I have as well and uh, probably shouldn't be tolerated quite as much as as, oh. as I had it. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure about the, the first time that I actually experienced it. I, yeah. I know one time I definitely did was when we were in Vanuatu, so that would have been about 98, I reckon, and doing a, a fairly deep dive on air, so a 54 metre dive on air, which there's, there's no way we would do that now. We would always use mixed gases and, and helium to do those dives. But back then it was sort of de rigueur. And I, I yeah, crawled out of the cave and had a sore arm and uh, just, you know, I was a little bit embarrassed to mention it. So I, I didn't really say anything. Sometime that night it, it went away and then I got up in the morning, right as rain and, and good to go again. But I mean, you, you are right in what you say. It's, uh, it's more a hazard to be managed than something to be avoided. And, and for those listeners that have done open water diving, they, they will know that you get this this talk about and the whole culture in in open water and recreational diving is to put the, the fear of God into you about decompression sickness. And if it happens, then, you know, that's probably the end of your diving career or you're going to have three months off or whatever, and then you're going to have to dive conservatively for um, the rest of your days. But in technical diving, we, we tend to just think well it's it's when it happens rather than if and um, it'll it'll come along sometime and it's it's not the end of the world there's there's far more serious things that can happen to you than that but there was a a, a more <laughs> serious case that happened in the the south china sea which was the first of uh, recognizing that there might be more of a problem uh, yes yeah that was the first time that i had the, the funny arm and oh. uh, my left left hand just goes all wobbly and, and won't work anymore. Well, completely um, paralysed. So, well, ish, ish. Okay. ish. Yeah. yeah, a bit paralysed, yeah. A little bit paralysed. Yeah, so that was the first time I was really recognised as neurological syndrome, a neurological syndrome or a, a type 2 DCS, and that, that normally has more, a bit more profound implications. So fortunately, I was diving off a boat that had a, a recompression chamber on it, so I hopped in there and spent a few hours in there and came out right as rain. Thought it was prudent to have the next day off, so I did that and then back into it again. But the therapeutic intervention of the recompression chamber was the thing that actually nearly killed you from what I recall? Well, there was a little bit of inconvenience. So this was this was an old boat and uh, this recompression chamber. So this boat was run by a, a guy called uh, Vidar Skogli who's a, a Norwegian character, or born in Norway, grew up in Australia and then uh, escaped to Southeast Asia and has lived there ever since. Uh, and he had this boat that we used to go diving off and this chamber he'd found at the bottom of the ocean, which it hadn't been submerged there for a long time. So he, uh, he salvaged it, cleaned it up, got all the rust off it and uh, pressure tested it, put new plumbing on and he thought, well, we might as well stick that on the boat just, just in case. So it was there. It, it didn't look too bad, but I wouldn't say that the the maintenance that was done on it was as good as in your normal hyperbaric facility. So there was there was a few inches of condensation in the bottom of the chamber, and when we decided that I was going to go in the pot, you had to climb up this this ladder to get into it. So I started climbing up this ladder and that was when I got really wobbly and and collapsed and fell back down the ladder. And so they worked out, they they shoved a bit of uh, board up there and uh, put me on it and then slid me into the chamber. And uh, I ended up just inside the the hatch in a bundle. 
uh, face down in the bottom of the, the chamber and with my face in the water. And seriously, no word of a lie, I could not move enough to even turn my head to the side and get my, my face out of the water. So after all the things I've been through, nearly drowned in an inch of water in the bottom of the chamber. But fortunately, somebody noticed my plight and grabbed my hair and, <laughs> uh, and pulled my face out of it. And the rest went more or less routinely. Oh, excellent. So that was the first time that something, you know, more than just a bit of an aching wrist or, or such had, had occurred to you. And then was the next time when we were in Christmas Island? Yeah, probably, you know, I started to occasionally just get a bit of numbness and tingling, but nothing, uh, nothing really more serious than that, as I recall. I mean, I should have written all these things down at the time. They've, they've all faded into, into history now. It's so long ago. But uh, yeah, there was, we went another round uh, in, in Christmas Island. That was, was quite an adventurous day, actually, that one, because we, we started out by getting lost at sea, doing a, uh, doing a dive and getting carried off by the, the current drifting out to sea and oh. after we'd done our decompression we popped our heads up and uh, looked around and no boat and oh. the, the, the islands disappearing oh. it looked like over the horizon and we're headed off to antarctica which if anybody knows where christmas island is there's there's not a lot around it so uh, we spent a couple of hours waiting around and uh, the boat was frantically searching they were definitely a lot more worried about it than we were and uh, then yeah we got found well, I think the skipper and, was fishing, uh, if I recall correctly. Yeah, well, that was a little bit naughty, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we came in from the dive. We headed into the hospital. And I, I looked over. Sorry, we were heading into land. And I looked over and noticed that your your arm was looking a bit funny again, and it was all floppy like a like a fish. And uh, you, then you slow, slowly slumped down to the the deck of the boat. And I said, "What's going on, Craig?" And you you said, oh, "I think my arm's a bit funny again." So uh, we had to head into the hospital. I have never seen anybody so delighted in my entire life as you were when you realised that you might get to operate on me. <laughs> well, I wish there was an operation for the bends, but even I couldn't think of anything to do. But what I did manage to do, much to my personal satisfaction, was uh, when we realised that we couldn't get you out of the boat to get you to into the ambulance to the hospital, I commanded the skipper to drive the boat onto the trailer and then take the boat and trailer to the emergency department of the Christmas Island Hospital. And I remember very clearly us pulling into the, yeah. uh, the ambulance bay in the back of the boat. Uh, I reckon we were the first patients to be delivered by that technique to the Christmas Island Hospital. And then we managed to uh, get you in. By then you were actually starting to recover, which was a bit disappointing. But uh, we got you into the emergency department and we're covered in sand and, you know, stuff. And I asked the nurses if I could uh, help them by putting a drip in your arm. And at that point, the, the chief nurse of the hospital walked in and boy, did she go crook at us. She gave me a real serve, tried to send me out of the emergency department. Some bloke in his bathers covered in sand I don't putting... Know. You know, I don't know come if you'd up. actually identified yourself as a doctor, had you, at that well, stage. You were I just mean, some dude as far as they were concerned. Helpful, helpful dude. <laughs> And then I tried to organise a medivac for you, but you you steadfastly refused and and got better despite all those attempts to get you back to Australia for further embarrassment. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, adapt and overcome as far as the boat delivery goes. You know, there's there's always room for a bit of uh, improvisation, and uh, made a pretty good story to tell afterwards. So there was one um, further time, and I won't look bore everyone with these countless episodes of me intervening and saving your life, but uh, there was one further episode, and then you went off uh, to get a more formal assessment done uh, to see what was going on, and um, what did they find, Craig? Uh, yeah, so I had a condition called uh, patent for amen ovale, or uh, PFO, as it's more normally known, and this is a pretty common condition, you know, you'd almost say it, it falls into the, the normal range. I think I usually quote about 30% of adults uh, have it. You're the one that really should be explaining this, but nevertheless, I'll have a crack. So it's a, it's a, a bypass in the heart, a, a shunt, which normally when you're a, a fetus allows you, you, most of your bloodstream to uh, go past the lungs because you're obviously not breathing at that stage. And it should close just after birth, but in, in quite a lot of people, it doesn't. And uh, so I was obviously one of those people. And that allows bubbles after diving to bypass the lungs where they normally get caught and uh, go into the circulation. And that is 
one of the things, it's always been a little bit controversial and there's a lot of arguments about how significant a factor it, it really is in cases where people get decompression sickness that's, you know, unexplained for want of a better term. But uh, in my case, I went off to, to have the scan and sure enough, that's what I did and had surgery, which was no big deal. It's done uh, done conscious and just a, a day, so oh, I had to stay overnight, but uh, then carried on as uh, as normal. I think they did advise me to, to have three to six months off diving and a week seemed like enough for me. So uh, I was back into it. And I'm very pleased to report that not one incident of uh, decompression sickness since then. So that was six years ago. So maybe I should have listened to you a bit earlier. Oh, no, no need to rush into these things. Oh, that's good. So that's been a good outcome. And I think it's a good story for anyone who's listening who who does dive and, uh, you know, has this fear of decompression sickness, which and it's something that should be taken seriously because not all these stories have a happy ending. And you know, you could have easily become permanently disabled or paralysed uh, from one of those incidents. So I'm well, very glad you, you're alive and well, Craig, and able to continue uh, diving with us. Yes, yeah, well, you'd, uh, you'd have to go a long way to find someone that puts up with you as well as I do, Harry. That's true. So, I mean, let's just touch on that because we've um, done quite a bit of diving together over the years and uh, we have a, a bit of a niche interest in deep cave exploration in particular, which... I can't understand why more people aren't particularly fascinated by that aspect of our sport, but it, it is uh, it does give us an opportunity to go to a few caves which are still unexplored and have, have potential for exploration. And part of the, the stuff we've done together, and this is all a, a gentle build-up towards Thailand, which we will have to discuss at some, some stage, Craig, we, we developed a bit of an interest in cave rescue because I remember one partic- particular trip we were out at a cave called Cocklebitty Cave on the Nullarbor. And uh, it's basically about a three to four kilometre swim into the cave to reach a remote air chamber called Toad Hall, which is pretty isolated. And it's quite a difficult place to negotiate the large boulders and, and so forth, which you have to carry your scuba equipment over to get to the next bit of water, the next sump in the cave. And I remember talking to you saying that what would happen if you know, one of us broke a leg in here or, or we became disabled, who would be able to rescue us? And in fact, a lot of Australia's, you know, r- reasonably competent cave divers were on that trip with us. So it would have been hard to know who to call for help and how would anyone be able to get us, say, with a broken leg out through the water back to the surface. Uh, and that's maybe where the idea of a cave rescue program or, or capability started to form, at least in, in my mind. And based on that, Sadly, there was no rescue, which followed immediately, but tragically, the the death of a couple of divers in the Mount Gambier caves, including a good friend of ours, Agnes uh, Malauka, gave us, opportunity is the wrong word, but gave us the the experience of being involved with the South Australian police to to help with some body recoveries. And I think that's when I, it kind of occurred to me that you were a, a fairly dependable and unflappable chap during those those body recoveries because they weren't pleasant things to be involved with. And so when the balloon went up in Thailand and, um, you know, we kind of had this experience along with some other people under our belts of, of working towards cave rescue and uh, being involved in these recoveries with the police, we were a couple of the names that got bandied around, particularly by the British divers who were in Thailand. And that's perhaps how, how we came to get involved. What, what was your first knowledge or recollection about the the thing in Thailand, Craig? Yeah, so I just heard about it on the news like everybody else, really. Mm-hmm. I'd obviously pricked up my ears a bit because, you know, because of the, uh, the interest we had, direct interest in cave diving. And uh, having had this interest in rescue all those years, I think we both despaired of, of ever actually getting a go. So any chance that that might present itself, we were, were right into. And uh, then, I mean, happily once Rick Stanton and John Valanth and the two British divers were on site, we had a direct line of communication and, yeah. and knew what was, was going on. But so, I mean, my first, once the boys were found, I mean, that that changed everything because up until then, I think both of us and, and most people in, in cave diving thought that that was more likely to be a, 
a search and recovery mission rather than a search and rescue. You know, after nine days, I mean, who would have thought that these kids would have been found and and safe when, in all likelihood, they'd they'd perished during the initial flood event anyway. Uh, but when it was suggested that uh, there would be a, a cave diving rescue for these kids that were over two kilometres inside the cave, I thought that's impossible. Remembering that we were told that. So these kids didn't even know how to swim. And so the the idea that, uh, you know, we'd just teach them to be cave divers in, in a couple of days and then dive them out was just crazy. I and mean, normally take many, many years to get to the stage where you'd be able to do a, a dive like that. Didn't think that there was any chance of a, a cave diving rescue and that there would have to be some other way of getting them out. But yeah. of course, we both wanted to be as close to the action as we could. So stuck up our hands and said, look, we're happy to come up and, and have a look and see if we can be of any assistance. And didn't really, I think, imagine that we'd be doing the actual rescue at that stage. It was much more likely that we were just going to be there in an advisory capacity. But it was still pretty good to be close to the thick of it. What were your impressions of the site when you first got out of the the minivan, opened that door, and what did you see when you first arrived at the cave? Well, my first two impressions were that it was utter chaos and that it was muddy. The place was an absolute quagmire and there were what it seemed like thousands of people running around. We didn't know. I, I, to this day, I don't know what they were all doing there. I've heard figures of anywhere between 2,000 and 10,000 people that were on site. And uh, you, you can account for a few of them doing, you know, logistics and cooking and cleaning and uh, bringing stuff and, and uttering wise words and all of that. But what all those thousands of people were doing there, I really don't know. But fortunately, we were getting looked after and uh, sheltered from, from all the broader implications. And uh, we were whisked off to uh, see the British divers and uh, start working out a, a plan now, by this stage, I think most of the other suggestions of how to get these kids out had been um, eliminated as being implausible. And it was uh, to our mutual alarm starting to look more and more like it was going to be a, an actual cave diving rescue. What's other, what sort of other stuff were they talking about attempting or had they been attempting to, to get the kids out? So they, they they had all these drilling rigs all over the place and uh, you know, some of them were drilling down into the, the groundwater and they were pumping millions of litres of, of water every hour out of the ground to, to try and drop the water table and get the cave to, to drain into it. They were fly, they stripped down a, a drilling rig and flew it up into the hills above where the boys were to, to try and drill down into Chamber 9. Remembering that, a, a few years before there'd been that mine rescue in, in uh, was it Peru or Chile or somewhere like that, where they drilled down about 600 metres and, and rescued these guys that had spent a couple of months down there. And so a lot of people thought that the same could be done, but there were various reasons why that wasn't really a starter. One of the ideas that was, I think, quite seriously suggested was actually leaving the boys in there and to get in enough food and, and supplies to last them until the, the monsoon was over and the cave actually dried back out again and they could walk out. And we didn't think that was really a starter because you know, they, they would succumb to exposure or infection. And we also didn't think there was enough room in there for about four or five months worth of food. So uh, I doubt they would have survived that. There were also... Uh, few stranger ideas. I, I remember somebody was proposing, or the, I think they actually had on site about uh, two kilometres of plastic tubing, and uh, they thought that the cave divers could swim that into where the boys were, pump it full of air so that all the water was expelled and the boys could just uh, crawl or, or walk out. You know, I don't know if anybody had ever, or the people that were suggesting that had ever tried to stretch that stuff through a cave, but that was just a, a crazy idea. And of course, the venerable Elon Musk turned up with his submarine as well, and uh, was uh, was suggesting that we could swim this thing in to where the boys were, and uh, just pop one of the boys in and swim back out with it again. But uh, that that wouldn't have fitted through the restrictions in the cave. 
So there were all those those sorts of things going on. The, the boys had a few ideas of their own as well. I, I should admit they, uh, they they were trying to tunnel their way out, and that was a pretty handy effort when when we inspected it. And I was quite impressed actually with this tunnel. It was it's probably about four or five meters long. And uh, sadly, it was heading in exactly the wrong direction from where they should have been going. So heading into the hill rather than out. But, and it would have taken them a while, I reckon, to get out two kilometres. But nevertheless, they were they were giving it a crack. Mm-hmm. But none of those things were, when they were given con- serious consideration, going to work. And uh, so cave diving was it. Yeah, I'll put a photo of that up on the, the video feed of, of that tunnel. Because when we went back to visit the boys in the following April, I took a... Took a nice photograph of that, and it was a considerable effort. It was it was good stuff, and I guess that was just very good for their morale to be kept busy under the direction of uh, Coach Eck, who seems like an amazing young man to to keep them all uh, busy and keep their morale up. I think it was a, a good exercise and worthwhile. But yeah, as you point out, they had a few kilometres to go. Oh yeah, yeah, and I, you know, I often reflect on what it must have been like for those those kids there for you know nine days in there in the dark most of the time and of course they still had working lights when they were found but it was uh, yeah they'd been conserving their batteries for you know, as, as best they could so they must have been sitting there in the dark a lot of the time no food and you know these kids aren't stupid I mean they're, they're, they're pretty sensible and uh, despite the fact that they come from the back blocks of northern Thailand I mean, I'm sure they know the world the way the world goes round. And I mean, they must have definitely had their moments where they thought it's all over and nobody's coming. I've never spent nine days sitting alone in a cave, but you know, with no plan for for getting out, I can't imagine what it was like. And I remain to this day pretty impressed that they were tough enough to stand up to that. So we, the first night we arrived on site, as you mentioned, we we had a chat to the British divers to get the lay of the land. And then the next day, you and I dived into the cave with the plan of going to visit the kids and checking out the location, checking out their physical condition and their, you know, how they were faring in terms of their morale. Just describe what the cave dive itself was like. How does it, how does it rate compared to other stuff that you've done? Oh, look, I wouldn't call it a, a, a terribly technical dive it was just you know it took took a while so i think that whole trip was about a six hour round trip for us which probably four hours of that was diving i guess but it was dirty i mean we couldn't really see much at all most of the way through the cave visibility was about 10 centimeters and so there was you were doing it all by feel which so the uninitiated sounds like a pretty big deal. And to cave divers, we often deal with that situation, usually on the way out of the cave rather than the way in once we've uh, kicked up a lot of silt as we're moving through the cave. But it's it's not that big a deal once you get the head or, your head around the fact that you've got enough information to, to get by and you can find your way out from a guideline. So from that point of view, not... Not so difficult, but you know, there's a lot of apprehension about how this whole story was going to play out, and you know, what were these kids going to look like? What, what sort of condition were they going to be in once we got there? And you know, was it was it even possible? And it, it, I, I always remind people when I'm talking about this rescue. I mean, we we sort of make light of it a bit and uh, and joke around a bit, but we totally expected there to be casualties. You know, it, it's people were bandying around numbers like 50% casualty rate and that sort of thing. I, I don't know. It wouldn't have surprised me a lot if we'd lost the whole lot of them, to be honest. I, I thought it was impossible what we were attempting. But, of course, there was a, a nil chance of them surviving if we didn't give it a go. So, you know, given comparing with certain death, we couldn't make that situation any worse. But it, uh, it you know, I'd certainly, you know, weighed pretty heavily on us. It's, it, it's, it, it focuses your attention when you go in and uh, you, you you see these kids and you know they are happy, healthy kids. They they're joking around and uh, acting the fool a little bit, and you think, well, you know. By this time tomorrow, we could be dragging those kids out in a body bag through a situation of our own making. And, uh, yeah, it's not not to be taken that lightly. No, and that brings brings us to some of the moral dilemmas, I think, of this rescue, which we haven't 
talked about a lot, but you know, we discussed on that night after our first dive into the cave when it was becoming clear that it was very likely that the cave diving rescue was going to proceed the next day and that was going to involve an, an anaesthetic, which uh, added another level of difficulty and danger, I think, for the kids and uh, obviously something that I was very concerned about. And in fact, I shared your, your pessimistic view, perhaps exceeded your pessimistic view. I, I felt that there was absolutely zero chance that that could possibly uh, lead to a, a successful outcome for any of the children. And I'm glad you kind of framed it in that way by saying that we couldn't make it any worse because they were going to, to die if we didn't do something. So that's the only thing I think that gave me the courage to, to proceed with that plan. But we talked about some stuff that first night before we went in for rescue day number one. And one of the things we talked about was what was going to happen if the first one or two children died as they left chamber nine through to cham chamber eight where you were waiting for them. So my, my job was to go through to chamber nine where the kids were with the four British divers who were going to escort the kids out. And your job was to receive them in chamber eight after the first dive, which was probably one of the longer dives in the cave. It was about 20 minutes duration, about 300 meters length. So it was a pretty good test of the whole operation. And we'd set up the idea that uh, Rick Stanton would wait there until the first boy had passed and then he would come in and tell me whether that had been successful or not. And one of the things we, we talked about was, you know, how many kids will die before we say, you know, enough. And I think we decided between us, or perhaps I'd decided in my own mind that two children, you know, if they hadn't survived that first part of the journey, then I didn't feel like I could carry on at least that day. There were some. There was a bit of a mix-up, I think, on that and that part of the plan. Do you remember? Yeah, there, there was. I mean, well, which I'll fairly and squarely put at your feet. That was that was nothing to do with me. But we had oh, a, a. I'm calling it a mix-up, Craig. I know you're calling it a mix-up. <laughs> I'm calling it a balls-up. <laughs> Uh, the the idea was that uh, Rick was just, was going to go through after the first boy uh, appeared and just report to you whether it had worked or not. And you'd obviously forgotten that you were in a cave in Thailand. I thought that you were in the uh, the operating theatre in uh, in Flinders Hospital back in Adelaide or something. And thought, well, you know, time is money. We better keep them moving. Otherwise, we're going to have people sitting around on their hands, and uh, we'll all be late home for dinner. So uh, you just cracked on and sent the second one through. And that, that caused us a little bit of bother, actually, because we weren't ready. Uh -huh. Things had gone awry a little bit in Chamber 8. Uh, we had some helpers that were supposed to come through and assist me with getting these kids over this, this dry chamber and getting all of their gear across with them. And, of course, they all needed a, a bit of a top-up of the anaesthetic at that point as well. And all of a sudden we had... Two kids there on our hands. Uh, we're only halfway through processing the first one, and I thought you'd just you'd just gone crazy. But uh, nevertheless, we uh, we managed to overcome that and and get on with it, work around it, and, and happily you realised the magnitude of your error and didn't send the third one through straight away because that would have uh, really been a problem for us. But, you know, on that matter of, I remember we spent quite a long time actually discussing about what would make us stop. And I, I took a little bit of a different attitude to you. I think that, you know, even if we'd lost the first one or two in, in my mind, and this is assuming that there wasn't something obvious going wrong that we could fix, but who was to know what would happen with the third one and the fourth one? <clears throat> and uh, it, it didn't, you know, the fact that we'd been unsuccessful in the first couple of goes didn't change the equation for the rest of the boys. I mean, they were still going to die if they stayed in there. That was not, was unaltered. And uh, so I thought we had to press on regardless and, and just keep going. And you can't predict how these, the, the statistical distribution is going to work out. So we might have lost the first one or two and then had nine uh, or 11 successes after that. Who was to know? I, I, you know, the last thing from my mind really was just walking away. But uh, a tough decision. There's no right or, or wrong about that. And, yeah, you know, I do suspect that if, if push had come to shove and we'd been in that situation, that uh, you probably would have had to change your opinion because, you know, you couldn't just throw down the tools, go back to Australia and say, well, they're on their own now because, uh, because I want, don't want to do this anymore. No, and I'm glad, obviously, we didn't have to to face that 
decision point. The other thing we talked about was if some children died on the first day, what was I going to say to the kids on the on the second day? And again, you know, how do you lie to a bunch of kids who are waiting to undergo the same recipe and yet how can you not lie to them? You know, how can you possibly tell them the truth and then expect them to be cooperative? And I, one thing I did know was that I couldn't manhandle any kids down to the water's edge and then assault them with a syringe full of ketamine and, you know, push them underwater after that. There's just uh, no way I was prepared to do that. So I think, you know, we'd agreed we'd have to tell a bit of a fib the next day and say off we go. So, yeah, there's a lot of interesting morality around this. I mean, the consent is the other issue that we, again, either, well, we didn't avoid facing it, but we were never invited to talk to the kids' parents. We never even saw them, in fact. And again, what an impossible discussion to have with those boys, mother or father or guardian. So, you know, it makes me wonder whether this rescue would have been possible in a country like Australia where those conversations would have been unavoidable. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult question because, you know, we talk about people having, making, you know, informed consent and yeah. and, and being fully informed about the, the facts around decisions that, that affect their future. But those, those kids and, and, you know, those parents, they were never, you know, never going to be in a situation to really make a truly informed decision anyway. And some people have to, you know, somebody had to just step up. And I think it's interesting, you know, I've remarked before to to observe people in, in times of crisis. And yeah. you know, much as we would like to think that we would all, you know, objectively analyse the situation and uh, and make the best decision we could on the basis of the information available. But it, it's been my observation that when people are in a situation that they can't control, that it's a crisis and it's it's got pretty grave implications for them, then then it, most people, I reckon, they just want somebody to tell them what to do if the situation is really beyond you dealing with it on your own, then, uh, you know, most people just want a white knight to come along on the big Arab charger and and save the day. And um, I'm, I'm sure that's that's really, you know, it sounds as condescending as it sounds, that's probably what was required in this case. Yeah, I agree. I think if I was at the bottom of a crevasse and Edmund Hillary appeared by my side and said, come with me, well, firstly, I'd be a little bit shocked because it'd be about 110 by now, but you'd exactly. certainly be happy to take that the, the hand that was offered. If you, if you know you're stuck and out of your depth, literally, then then that kind of help would be very welcome. Might not necessarily be the way you'd tell the story later. But, oh, uh, yeah. No, obviously self-rescue right. occurred and uh, yeah. Yeah, Edmund was never yeah. seen. And, and you threw Edmund over your shoulder and carried him out of the crevasse too. <laughs> like I've done for you so many times. <laughs> <laughs> We're nearly out of time, Craig, but there's a couple of other things that again could have been serious but turned out to be funny in, in retrospect. One of them was on that first rescue day, we all felt quite crook during the dive in and out. And uh, I remember comparing notes that evening around the, the table with yourself and the British guys. And I, I remember having this terrible feeling come over me like I had the flu, I was really weak and shaky and I just felt really crook and, and started to think, geez, I'm, I'm actually not up to this and how am I going to do this for another couple of days after, after today? And uh, you had some some symptoms on that dive as well. Yeah, so I had a really bad headache, and I, I never get headaches, and I never get them particularly when when I'm diving. So this was very unusual for me. And it's uh, I mean, the first thing I draw from the story is it's absolutely amazing what you can rationalise in the heat of the moment and and just explain away to yourself. Because in looking at it in hindsight, it's obvious that there was something really badly wrong there, but nobody mentioned it. Everybody just just kept on. And it's the first day of the rescue and there's a lot depending on everyone. So nobody wants to you know, let let the side down and everybody thinks it's just them. But once we we're in the cave, we got to, to chamber seven and uh, somebody said, you know, I don't, I don't feel all that good. And I said, yeah, I've got a bit of a headache. And uh, we kept going and we realised that we had bad air in the cylinders. So that's that's a really dangerous thing. A lot could have gone wrong. And it's, <clears throat> it's very lucky that this dive wasn't very deep and that we didn't have a whole load of decompression because uh, we could have all gotten a, a serious spot. And it, it, it wouldn't have been a good look if we'd had a whole load of dead rescuers lying around in the cave and the kids still to be dealt with. 
So it turned out that the the compressor that was being used to fill the, the cylinders, they had run out of out of filters for the compressor that normally strip out the the hydrocarbons and the moisture and the uh, and carbon monoxide out of the out of the breathing gas. And so when they'd run out of filters, they just kept using this compressor and it was running sort of twenty four seven as far as I can ascertain. I mean there are hundreds of cylinders to be filled. And then, yeah, it was, there was some sort of nastiness going on in there, which could have been the end of all of us. But we just scouted around and grabbed as many as we could of the, the cylinders that had been we knew had been filled earlier and were probably safe. And once we're into it, there wasn't much we could do but press on. Uh, so that, that first day, obviously, four kids came out alive and well, and we only found that out once we exited the cave essentially when we got to the the end of the final dive into chamber three to be greeted by the American pararescue guys who were able to tell us that uh, four out of four were okay, which was a a huge relief. And then the uh, the second day, repeat and same fantastic result. And uh, so excited with with the Thai people that in fact the prime minister decided to attend that evening and we'd been running on a couple of hours sleep really a night for a few days and you know very late night meetings and debriefs and a lot a lot of expectations around us and probably not sleeping that well thinking about the the day ahead and this story I think reflects very well on me Craig and I want you to tell it and and feel free to embellish it as much as you like. So yeah we'd been through the first couple of days of the rescue and they'd, they'd been pretty long days at the office I think we'd been spending about 10 hours in the cave each day so we were getting a bit tired and increasing confidence. We had had eight of these boys out, but still had a long day to go the next day. And there's absolutely no way that we thought, well, we're, we're home and hosed. You know, there was still room for a lot to go wrong. And certainly the last thing that we had in our minds was being all starstruck at a, a visitation from the, the Thai Prime Minister. We could just see ourselves spending a few more hours on site and we thought, look, said to somebody, you know, get us out of here. We need to go. And they said, the, the roads are blocked. They don't let anybody through because the Prime Minister's on the way. So I'm afraid you're stuck here. And uh, look, I've got to uh, give you full credit for this one, Harry, as, as reluctant as I am to do that. But in this divine flash of inspiration, uh, you said to someone, look, would an ambulance be able to get through? And I said, oh, well, look, I, I suppose, yeah, I, you know, if it was an emergency, ambulance would be able to get through the roadblock. And okay, there'd been these 13 ambulances sitting on site for the whole time. I don't know why. I mean, somebody must have had the idea in their heads that these boys might just spontaneously appear from the, the cave by themselves, evading all the, the efforts of the rescuers. And so they'd better be ready if that happened. So there's still still five ambulances on site, and yeah. you you disappeared for a little while. I don't I don't know where you went or who you spoke to, but yeah. when you came back, you said I've got a plan, and uh, go and stand over in that car park, and somebody will be along. So we went and stood over there for uh, I don't know maybe 15 minutes or so, and then this ambulance turns up, and I thought, yeah, you beauty. So I said, well, you, you hop in the front and I'll, I'll, I'll get in the back because it'll be a bit boring in there. And, and opened up the, uh, the back of the ambulance and it wasn't quite what I was expecting because there are about 13 Thai nurses in there. So uh, we had a, uh, a great time in the back of the ambulance. Well, not, um, not that great, Craig. Take it easy. This is a, well, it was this all, a PG. It was all, it was all good fun. Yeah, well, of course, as a family. Oh, I don't mean to suggest that anything untoward happened, but uh, no. they were all right. yeah quite excited. And yeah. uh, you, you were obviously keeping an eye on things from the, the front. Yeah, seat. well, I, so, I kind of uh, regret I, I wasn't it. in any danger at all. No, no, no. Anyway, no, it does reflect well on me that story, and I yeah. thank you for yeah. for telling it with such enthusiasm because that was uh, genius. It <laughs> was a moment of genius. Yeah. Well, I think that's all we've got time for, Craig. I think that's given you know people who follow the show more than enough information about the Thai Cave Rescue through your eyes. And I'm very grateful for this time we've had together today, Craig, and the opportunity to talk to you. You're a most interesting chap. 
and I think this will be one of the best rating shows by far. So until we see each other again, Craig, I bid you adieu. Well, that's the show for today. Thanks for joining me. If you want any more information, you can check out the podcast website at realriskpodcast.com. Listener.